Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Temple Emmanuel. On behalf of the Men's Club and the Program Committee, chaired by Dr. Claudia Plotel. Welcome to this panel discussion on the subject, The Future of Jewish Denominations. I'm Ben King, President of the Men's Club. Before I turn the program over to our, the Senior Rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, I want to introduce our panelists. Rabbi Elliot J. Cosgrove is Senior Rabbi at Park Avenue Synagogue. He began his tenure at Park Avenue Synagogue in 2008. A leading voice in the conservative movement, he follows a tradition of distinguished rabbis in that pulpit, including Rabbi Milton Steinberg, Rabbi Judah Nadich, and Rabbi David H. Lincoln. Ordained at Jewish Theological Seminary in 1999, Rabbi Cosgrove earned his PhD at the University of Chicago Divinity School. His dissertation on Rabbi Louis Jacobs, a leading Anglo-Jewish theologian of the 20th century, reflects his passion for the intersection of Jewish scholarship and faith. Rabbi Cosgrove is the author of four collections of selected sermons and the editor of Jewish Theology in Our Time. A new generation explores the foundations and future of Jewish belief, held as a provocative and inspiring collection of essays by leading rabbis and scholars. Rabbi Cosgrove also serves the conservative movement the Jewish community beyond Park Avenue Synagogue and the community at large. He sits on the Chancellor's Cabinet of Jewish Theological Seminary and on the Editorial Board of Conservative Judaism, a member of the Executive Committee of the Rabbinical Assembly. He is also an officer of the New York Board of Rabbis and a member of the board of UJA Federation of New York. He serves as a rabbinical advisor on interfaith affairs for the ADL, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Rabbi Haskell Luxtein has been the rabbi of Congregation Kehilath Jesserin since 1958 and principal of the Ramaz School since 1966. He is Joseph H. Luxtein Professor of Homiletics at Yeshiva University, where he, is, where he has been teaching since 1979. He also serves as Vice President of Beth Din of America, and he's a member of the Board of Directors of UJA Federation of New York. He is a commissioner of New York City Human Rights Commission. He served as president of the New York Board of Rabbis, chairman of the National Rabbinic Council of UJA, and president of the Synagogue Council of America. A 1949 graduate of Ramaz School, Rabbi Luxstein received his BA from Columbia College and his master's degree in medieval Jew Jewish history and his PhD in modern Jewish history from the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Yeshiva University. He was ordained by Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik and Dr. Samuel Belkin as a graduate of the Rabbi Isaac Lechanan Theological Seminary in 1958. The rabbi's doctoral dissertation was published in 1985 under the title, Were We Our Brothers Keepers? The Public Response of American Jews to the Holocaust, 1938 to 1944. Most recently, his biography under the title, Rav Chesed, was published by Catan, Pub Catan Publishing Company. Rabbi Peter Rubenstein is the senior rabbi of Central Synagogue. He graduated from Amherst College 
and was ordained by Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York, where he received a Master of Hebrew Letters degree with honors. Prior to joining Central Synagogue, he served as the rabbi of Woodlands Community Temple in White Plains, New York, and at Peninsula Temple Bethel in San Mateo, California. Rabbi Rubenstein has taught at Manhattanville College, Colgate University, San Jose State, and Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in both New York and Cincinnati. He is the founder and chair of the Rabbinic Council of the World Union for Professional Judaism and co-chair of the Partnership of Faith in New York City. He is the founder and chair of the Rabbinic Vision Initiative aimed at the evolution of Ju Reform Judaism in North America. And he is a present and he is a frequent lecturer on the role of rabbi now and in the future. Rabbi Rubenstein serves on the board of Auburn Theological Seminary, of which he is the immediate past chairman, the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, UJA Federation of New York, United Way of New York, the Rabbinic Council of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, he is a recognized leader in the changing face of the Jewish community. He was ranked number three in Newsweek's 2012 list of America's 50 most influential rabbis, and he has been on that list since its inception. Welcome to our panelists. I would now like to call upon our senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, Joshua Davidson. Thank you, Ben, very, very much. And I certainly want to add my welcome to all of you. I thank our men's club and its president, Ben King, from whose creativity the idea for this conversation really emerged. And I want to thank our program committee chaired by Dr. Claudia Platel and our staff, especially our administrator, Mark Heitlinger. This is an exciting morning. Whenever you have one of these rabbis in the room, you know you're going to experience something special. But when you have all three of them with you, you're in store for something extraordinary. And it means a great deal to me to have joined recently this wonderful rabbinic chevra and to have the three of them here in this synagogue, which I'm thrilled to call my new home. They're not strangers to me. For the first five years of my rabbinate, I served as Rabbi Rubenstein's assistant and associate at Central Synagogue. The saying goes, one shouldn't attempt to put into words what really can't be expressed in words. And so of Peter, I will simply say that he was, is, and will always remain my great mentor, teacher, and friend. I first met Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove on a UJA mission to the former Soviet Union and was taken with his intellect and vision. And since my appointment to Emmanuel last spring, I've been overwhelmed by his kindness, humor, and warmth. And I look forward to the years ahead with him just up the street. And Rabbi Haskell Luxteens was a name I heard in my home, forgive me Haskell, as a young kid. He and my father, Rabbi Jerome Davidson, worked together on behalf of the Synagogue Council of America. And his outreach across denominational lines was then pioneering, as were his commitments on matters of social justice, and so they remain. The title of this program, as you know, is The Future of Jewish Denominations. And over the next 75 minutes or so, we will explore whether we are living in or moving toward a post-denominational era or whether we should be. And we will examine the challenges facing reform, conservative, modern Orthodox, indeed American Judaism, and whether our denominational commitments weaken us or strengthen us in our collective efforts. I'm going to be asking our panelists a series of questions which we develop together. And if we have time, we can open the conversation up for some of yours, too. In Rabbis Rubenstein and Luxtein, 
we're privileged to have in our midst two of the Gadole Hador, two of the great congregational rabbis of the past half century, and two of the great congregational <laughs> leaders. <laughs> I'm but enough. <laughs> and two of the great congregational leaders of the modern Orthodox and Reform movements. So each of you has the perspectives to look back as well as ahead. And I'd ask you to reflect for a moment on where modern Orthodox Judaism, on where Reform Judaism was when you were sitting in your first seminary classes and how it's changed and where the American Jewish community was when you first began to lead it and how it's changed. Peter, why don't you begin with the reform movement and then we'll turn to Haskell. You know, I'm sitting next to really one of the greats, uh, actually two of the greats, and I'm very aware of it, but uh, Haskell Lickstein has been such a mentor uh, in, in so many ways to so many rabbis simply by his being that to be compared to Haskell, to you, as I whisper to you, I am but a nothing. Um, there's a joke about that which I will not tell. That's good because I need to tell it one of these coming High Holy Days. <laughs> okay. That's right. Uh, I've been considering the question, and the question, of course, can be divided and it's, uh, into so many different categories, and it's difficult to imagine uh, how one should approach it. And, in certain ways, the very framework of Reform Judaism has altered, although the anchor of it has not. One could say that, and when I began, one, if asked what it meant to be a Reformed Jew, the question to the congregant was always answered by, well, these are the things I don't do, right? I don't drive, I, I don't keep kosher, I don't keep Shabbat, I don't... In other words, our members were very clear about what they didn't do. They had very little understanding of, therefore, what made them Reformed Jews. The closest we could get, I think, in those years were to talk about prophetic monotheism, that those were the catchwords that our members and we used to define what made us who we were. Uh, there were, in those days also, uh, very powerful national institutions, a subject to which I think we are going to return. And in fact, when one thought about Reform Judaism, the single definition that could be agreed upon was that a Reform Jew was somebody that belonged to one of the Reform Jewish institutions, either the Hebrew Union College or then the Union for uh, of, uh, American Hebrew Congregations or the Central Conference of American Rabbis. In other words, if you belong to a Reform congregation, you were therefore a Reform Jew. Now, I think there was always um, an underlying principle of Reform Judaism, which still remains intact, and that I'm not sure has changed, which is that the psychological and physiological needs of people have remained the same, true of Jews, that tradition wasn't always, neither was liturgy, that whatever gave rise to liturgy and tradition, um, those needs are still present, even though the need to change the format of them uh, may have altered. And so there has been great uh, transition, even transformation in some of the ways that Reformed Judaism has become expressed, certainly ritually and liturgically. Uh, Central Synagogue is significantly different now than what it was when it I came even 23 years ago. I was raised on the Union Prayer Book, which I know is familiar to this congregation, um, have been through the uh, uh, different iterations of our prayer book to the point that we have created our own liturgies generally because uh, we feel that uh, it's important to express the needs and a response to those needs in different ways rather regularly. So the reform movement has changed dramatically, organizationally, um, I think in the expression of ideology, although I don't think the ideology itself has changed. It has certainly changed in respect to its relationship with Israel, uh, in that uh, in the early years, although it wasn't true in my family, the, um, the movement was known for having some antithesis and being somewhat, uh, and, and some, uh, having some antipathy to Israel. Um, we know that historically, I would say over the past 
the decades that I've been a rabbi, um, coming on 50, uh, there has been an evolution in that. I don't want to track it because I'm not sure it has been a constant evolution. I think it has had blips and it would be interesting to try to define where we are now in relationship to Israel, especially with the millennial generation coming up. Uh, but in, in, in that regard, there has been a tremendous, from my perception, tremendous advance uh, in relation to the state of Israel. So we could spend more time than we have breaking down the separate categories. Um, certainly liturgically we've changed, organizationally we've changed. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the expression of ideology, we have changed. In terms of relationship to Israel, we've changed. And I would add one more thing, which is that the um, relationship of Reform Judaism to tradition, however we define it, has changed. Uh, so I would, I would think that those are categories that need to be named in terms of evolution. Um, it can be, we can plumb them further, but for now I think that covers the broad scope of, of how, we have, uh, how we have advanced. Thank you. Haskell? Uh, first, let me say that I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I have been here before. Uh, actually, my great-grandfather, the Ramaz, many of you know the name Ramaz, his name is Rabbi Moses Zavulun, R-M-Z, Margolis, uh, sat in that front row uh, here of this sanctuary at the funeral of Louis Marshall. And I think in many ways I am a product of that man who sat in the front row of your uh, synagogue, of this synagogue in the sense that unlike many of my colleagues I'm very happy to be together with all Jews and I don't sit in judgment uh, of anybody uh, and I'm part of Kalal Yisrael we'll probably get back to that subject uh, uh, later on but if I could go back to the Ramaz, Rabbi Moses Volon Margolis, we're talking about the 1920s, uh, maybe the late 1920s or the early 1930s. I don't remember exactly when Louis Marshall died. Um, he was a great Talmud Chacham, a great scholar. In that respect, I think I don't really take after him uh, as much as I would like to. I mean, he used to finish the Talmud every year on Passover Eve. Can you imagine that? You know there's such a thing today as Daf Yomi, which I'm struggling to do for the first time in my life now. I'm about 30 pages behind where I should be. <laughs> and my great-grandfather, it, it takes seven and a half years to finish the Talmud. He finished it in one year, and on Passover Eve, he made a siyum, a completion celebration to absolve the uh, kohanim uh, from uh, the responsibility of fasting. Um, seven and a half pages a day, because he could actually daven it. He knew it by heart, basically. As I say, I'm not a very worthy successor of his, but he was also a founder of the Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC. And that set a pattern for my father, who was my teacher and mentor and whom I followed in KJ. My, my father was in our congregation for 56 years. I've only been a rabbi in the congregation for 55 years, so I still consider myself to be a rookie. Um, uh, of being involved in everything. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm not answering your question. 
That's typical of, of me. <laughs> uh, your question was how things have changed. My father brought modern Orthodox Judaism to the Upper East Side. He wanted to create a synagogue, and he actually used this expression, which would be as aesthetically appealing and attractive as a reformed temple, and as warm and vibrant as a Hasidic shtibel. I think when I started in the rabbinate, and certainly when I was a kid, davening in the shul, we probably were closer to the formality of the reform temple than to the warmth of the Hasidic shtibel. As a matter of fact, when I walked in and saw my colleagues here, I, I couldn't help but smile to myself. Uh, here is a dean of the Reform Rabbinate who's sitting here in a nice open shirt on a Sunday morning, very casual, a, a young dean of the Conservative Rabbinate who's wearing a yellow shirt, very nice, and a <laughs> lavender tie. Uh, His wife the, is out of town. The, the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel is wearing a kind of a grayish shirt with, with a red tie. And my only compromise with informality is this uh, Hermé, uh, whatever color it is, I can't even describe <laughs> it, but I made sure to get dressed in my best blue suit and to wear a white shirt. I thought to myself, how can I go with a blue shirt with a white collar at a Temple Emmanuel? <laughs> Just goes to show how things have changed. Uh, Ramaz, when it started in 1937, when I was in the first grade, Ramaz was called Ramaz Academy. Posh. <laughs> now, we refer to it as Yeshivat Ramaz, unabashedly. Um, I talked about the formality. You know, in our synagogue, you had to wear a black kippah. If you came in with a colored kippah, somebody would come over to you and say, you can't wear that here in this synagogue. You've got to wear a black shmata. You know, the, the black, the old black, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, um, today, when I look at the people wearing black kippot in our synagogue, I think of them as right wing. Because most people in the synagogue, are, uh, most men in the synagogue, are wearing kippot like mine. Um, and not everybody's wearing a tie and a jacket necessarily. Although we're still sticklers, we don't give an aliyah to a man without a tie and jacket. We even have a, a supply of ties uh, <laughs> to give those who. Uh, <laughs> came to synagogue so inform informally. They offered uh, me a tie, I refused. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, but the interesting thing is that last Friday night, when we had a Yahad Shabbaton, the Yahad organization is an organization run by the, un the Orthodox Union for uh, children and young adults who are developmentally challenged. And once a year, we have a Yachad Shabbaton with about 50 Yachad members and a lot of counselors and Ramaz students who help out over that Shabbat. And these, these young people, they don't have inhibitions. They do whatever they feel they would like to do. So we were dancing up a storm on Friday night in the synagogue so much that uh, since I do keep uh, a, an eye on the clock and I don't want my members to go into cardiac arrest over the length of the service, so we had to sort of limit the dancing. But who would have ever dreamt in my father's day of dancing in shul on a Friday night or a Shabbat? 
morning, but we did it and we weren't afraid to do it. It's a much less formal service. Uh, I think we feel more comfortable with who we are. We don't have to uh, worry that uh, somehow we have to be acceptable on the Upper East Side. We are what we are, and we're proud of it. And uh, this is, by the way, a struggle that I had with my father. My father was very formal. He had to make Orthodox Judaism fit on Park Avenue. And therefore, he had to do this. And if he hadn't done it, we wouldn't have the synagogue, and we wouldn't have Ramans. But we've sort of moved quite a distance from it. Uh, we're also much larger than we used to be. Uh, I used to quietly take the count in, uh, on Shabbos morning. I mean, I didn't have a clicker or anything like that. But I would walk around surreptitiously, I thought, and count the men and women in, in the synagogue. And then after Shabbat, I would sit down and I, I had a, a notebook in which I kept the count. And I would note what the weather was because that is an effect, has an effect. What the sermon topic was because the sermon was the center of the service. Uh, and whether there was a bar mitzvah or some kind of an event. Um, and we had between 200 and 250 people in the synagogue, and that was really an accomplishment. Today, well, right now we're not in our synagogue because we had a fire two and a half years ago. With, with God's help, we hope to be back on, on, uh, in January of uh, next year. But normally on a Shabbat morning, we'll have five to 600 people in the synagogue because modern orthodoxy has grown. The reason it's grown largely has to do with day school education. In my synagogue today, there are so many people who are day school graduates themselves, quite literate, uh, and they feel very comfortable with their Judaism. So um, I'm actually talking a little bit about my own experience. Uh, I think it's to some extent true uh, beyond uh, our sin. Look, whoever had five, six, seven kosher restaurants on the Upper East Side and all kinds of opportunities for, for living a, a full Jewish life in every respect, when I grew up, there was one kosher synagogue in Manhattan, Lou G. Siegel's. I loved it. Today, you can take your choice of dozens and dozens of places. I think that has a lot to do with the growth of Judaism in general in the United States, not necessarily in numbers, but in practice, and particularly the modern Orthodox community and Yes, the right-wing Orthodox community. But we'll get to that yeah. uh, at some point further on. So I'm gonna. You told me five minutes, and I only took fifteen. <laughs> so I'm um, really very much on time. Uh, it felt like two. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So Elliot, in the few years that you've been at Park Avenue Synagogue, you've done much more than stylize the rabbinic wardrobe. <laughs> You've built a new... We, we go to the same gym. I see right. him dressed uh, very differently. Right, and if I could be doing what he's doing in the gym at that point, uh, it will have been a very successful career. He, he, he bench presses 25 <laughs> uh, pounds, and I'm, I'm Bakoshi Rob picking up 10-pound weights with my... It's very, very intimidating uh, Peter, person. Peter and I go to the same gym, too. It, it has these big yellow arches. <laughs> <laughs> so you have built a new, on top of your congregation's extraordinary past. You've created an excitement there, but also among New York's conservative Jews generally. You've taken important stances on inclusion, conversion, 
the role of the rabbi as leader of his or her flock. For many on the outside looking in, conservative Judaism means not orthodox and not reform. And no doubt you have some congregants who from a point of view of practice may not be all that different from Haskell's on the one side or Peter's on the other. So why do people join one congregation over another? Is movement ideology a factor? And for you, what is conservative Judaism all about? Let me, uh, in the spirit of my colleagues, also thank you, Rabbi, for inviting me to be part of uh, this panel with uh, colleagues who, both in person and in uh, the exemplary model of your careers, uh, are the, the gold standard uh, for anyone in our trade. Uh, and, and to you, uh, Josh, uh, the, I mean, the very fact that this is happening here, this hasn't happened in my first, uh, this is year six, I believe, since arriving at Park Avenue Synagogue. And I think it really speaks to uh, the, the role Temple Emmanuel uh, plays and potentially plays into the future. The Yom HaShoah observance, um, the convener of important communal conversations, and uh, your menschlichkeit, your leadership, and your vision uh, to do this is just one data point among many of uh, the spirit you've brought, and uh, please God, into the years ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I did not have any gray hair when I started my job. I'm looking at you, and, uh, and I look forward to being on a panel a year from now and see how you're doing. Uh, but uh, you're, you're very youthful, and uh, I get 10% off if you join my gym, and so, uh, look. I think, I think, let's just acknowledge something from the get-go. The Upper East Side is a unique place. There is, a, we are in a bubble here on the Upper East Side. So our problems are high-class problems that Rabbi Lookstein, Rabbi Rubenstein, Yorshul, um, there are uh, membership and seating issues, but the fact is the Upper East Side is underserved um, by congregational life. We can all thrive and, uh, and, and do well and define our unique and differentiated vision of Jewish life and living. Uh, and there are still gonna be Jews who need to join synagogues. Uh, and that is a beauty of uh, really, is, uh, 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 and, uh, and the, the, the demographics, the philanthropy, the uh, otherwise, this is not the story of American Jewish life. Uh, and I, I just think that needs to be acknowledged from the outset. The Pew study, interesting as it is for the Milwaukee and Pittsburghs and, and what the future of the conservative move, you have a vibrant Orthodox synagogue, a vibrant Reform synagogues here, and, and a vibrant conservative synagogue. So what, what does that mean uh, to your question, Rabbi? That I, I ask myself the question all the time. I say, I say not just why synagogue, but why a conservative synagogue? Now, incidentally, I think uh, I have members who are also members of Rabbi Lukstein's synagogue and also members of Rabbi Rubenstein's synagogue, and frankly, as I look here, also members of your synagogue. <laughs> so New York is, you know, you can be a member of two synagogues and, uh, and on, only in New York. Uh, the, so, so Park Avenue Synagogue prides itself uh, on a, a, what I would have to call an eclectic blend of traditionalism and liberalism. We have duchening, the priestly blessing on the holidays. We have uh, a full uh, Torah reading. We have uh, very traditional roles uh, in, in many ways, um, both small C and big C uh, there. But at the same time, there's music on Shabbat. Men and women stand equally before the Torah. Uh, the, uh, there, there is this uh, fascinating blend, which has something to do with the varied, you know, to go from Rabbi Steinberg to Rabbi Nadich to, to Rabbi Lincoln, uh, which really reflects Reconstructionist, conservative, and Rabbi Lincoln from an Orthodox background. And this is a thing I inherited. 
uh, Park Avenue Synagogue, which I actually think is an excellent uh, focal point for conservative Judaism. Because I ask myself, right, if I don't do this, I don't check cupboards, but if I were to look into Rabbi Rubenstein's congregants' cupboards, and mine, right, in the kitchen or otherwise, and, and maybe even Rabbi Lookstein's. I don't know if you would say, well, the dietary habits of my congregants, your congregants, and your congregants are so differentiated, necessarily. But I say, so why are they joining my synagogue and not his and not his and not yours? And I think that's because um, that there is a, a, what, what the chancellor of the seminary calls a vital Jewish center of people who in their private sphere are making personal choices on their own, but when they walk into a synagogue, um, they want a, a traditionalism, they want an authenticity, uh, they want uh, to, to, to access tradition uh, in a way that, uh, that, that speaks to the existential questions that are in all our souls, whether we're Orthodox, Reform, or Conservative. And, and as rabbis, we are um, giving them the tools by which uh, the riches of our tradition can uh, speak to those very questions. Right? That's the role of a rabbi. Uh, and I, I think this is a, 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 a change. Um, actually, I would say a revolution in how the conservative movement uh, sees its mission. Uh, I, I think historically, both ideologically, um, but also sociologically, the, you know, the, 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 the Arthur Hertzbergs, the Mordechai Waxmans, the Robert Gordeses, and the institutions that they created in the 20th century were vehicles by which um, an, an Eastern European uh, immigrant community could acclimate themselves into American Jewish life. So, Rabbi, I drive on Shabbos. How am I going to uh, uh, make sense of of this transformation? How is swordfish kosher or is it not kosher? Should I or shouldn't I add the matriarchs into my prayers or not? The conservative movement very much defined itself on this immigrant journey and it was the right movement at the right time, and that is why you have the Temple Israels and the, and, the, and the great synagogues and the great rabbis of the conservative movement. I think now American Jewry is in a totally different place. Uh, my congregants, your congregants, your congregants, all of our congregants are totally at ease in American Jewish life. Uh, they don't need uh, to have America explained to them. What they need, and, and frankly, right, the, the Pew study says this, 94%, I just heard the statistics, of, of American Jews, whether they're religious, not religious, Jews by whatever definition, they're proud of being Jews. 94%. People are not ashamed or, or, or hidden about their Jewishness. They're proud. They just don't know what being Jewish means. And, and so our responsibility shared, but with our own inflections, and is to, uh, to bring uh, Jews back into the fold. Uh, and, I, and I think this is the immigrant journey that uh, needs to be the calling card uh, of, of all of our rabbinates. And I think actually this is what uh, what conservative Judaism's uh, strong foot forward is, um, that we recognize <coughs> the assimilated, secularized place of uh, American Jewry, and we're seeking, uh, uh, and, and we're not, and, and we're validating that. We're validating that. Uh, but we're also express it saying why Torah is important, why Shabbos is important, why uh, a, a connection to a tradition that long preceded us and will extend well beyond us. Why are, the, why are these, uh, how, how these can enrich our lives? I, I think we all share that journey and I think the conservative movement is very well positioned. Uh, it has the tools to do that. Thank you. I'm going to stay with you for the next question and actually explore a topic which you've begun to open up. There's a reason why we created this forum addressing denominational Judaism, inviting congregational rabbis. 
There is almost, by definition, bound to be a difference between where a movement's leadership institutions, its rabbinic union, its seminary are, and where its congregations are. So are there issues that you wrestle with that the conservative movement's governing bodies have yet to wrap their arms around? What are the challenges facing conservative congregations the movement as a whole needs to address? And what does the movement need to do in order to flourish? I'm not just saying this to be polite. I'm actually, I'm really curious to hear how my colleagues respond to the question of movements, relationships to congregations because they've both taken leadership roles and I'm somewhat of a newcomer uh, to this conversation of the relationship of the congregation to the movement as a, as a whole. Uh, I, I have a bit of, uh, well, two things. Number one, uh, and this was also something that, that came out loud and clear in the Pew study, is uh, people are not joiners anymore. Uh, as congregational rabbis, we actually have it easy uh, in the sense that we are direct service providers. If Rabbi Rubenstein is there for a family in joy or in sadness, right, they have a direct, uh, a crisp answer as to why their synagogue is important to them and worthy of their support, right? But we don't have, but I get blank stares from my congregants if I say, you should really go to a United Synagogue convention. You should really take a leadership position on some broader movement. Uh, people are not, and, and I don't think this is uh, unique to the conservative movement or the reform movement. I think this is where America is. I, I, was, I had my high school kids over at, at my house last night, uh, and, I, and I said, how many of you are members of Boy Scouts or Eagle Scouts or any sort of umbrella organization. Uh, they're not. If I were to say there's a USY Kinus in uh, northern New Jersey, uh, they would have no idea. I'm speaking mumbo jumbo uh, to my kids, and that's just a conclave of, I don't know if this is the case in the reform movement of youth groups, but um, there's not a sense of connectedness to uh, missions that extend beyond the direct service institutions like our synagogues. Uh, and so I think that just needs to be acknowledged that uh, uh, we are living, as Robert Putnam said, in a bowling alone culture. People are not joining uh, broader movements in the same way. I think UJA is facing this. I think JDC is facing this. I think many organizations uh, are facing this question. Uh, on the question of the, the bigger movements, uh, I actually have a somewhat, uh, I've changed my stance on this in the last uh, year or two. Uh, there, there is an inclination among congregational rabbis to say, what has the movement done for me lately? I pay these dues, I, you know, this money could be used for a staffing position, for, um, for, for maybe a nicer suit, whatever it could be used for, and, and, and the movement is not serving anything. Uh, and we all say, what, do we, you know, what's, what are they doing? Um, I think that's silly today. Uh, uh, I think that the, that the three of us have a responsibility as uh, large, leading, financially stable congregations to be the laboratories for what the best of Orthodox and Reform and conservative Judaism can be. And the move, I, I had this fascinating moment, um, this is, I don't mean this to come out the way it does, but it's gonna come out the way. Um, the Park Avenue Synagogue budget is bigger than United Synagogue, okay? So if I'm sitting around saying, why isn't United Synagogue doing something for me? Uh, it's, 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 it's a ludicrous uh, proposition. What I should be doing is modeling the best Shabbos service, congregational school, adult learning, conversion program, pilot it, hand it to the movement and say, look, there's a synagogue in Milwaukee that doesn't have the resources that I have, but maybe they can take what we've piloted and it can be disseminated around to different things. I think the movements should be the meeting ground and the best practices place where congregations 
are, are, are demonstrating uh, the possibilities of Jewish life and living. Yeah, it's beautifully said. We are blessed to be in congregations that have resources, and we're in a, a city where the Jewish world convenes. And when you have the opportunities to impact that community, it really becomes a responsibility to find ways to do it and set those models. It's very beautifully said. Um, Peter, I, I want to turn the same question to you. Um, to borrow one of your favorite words, you've played an important role in utzing the reform movement's leadership to reassess how it goes about the business of strengthening its congregations and liberal Jewish life in America. What do the institutions of reform Judaism need to do to achieve this? What do reform congregations need to be in order to thrive? Well, okay, um, I, I, I hold my breath because um, it's my way of trying to uh, assimilate the question and, and assess it. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to figure out, Elliot, whether I agree with you or not. Uh, so uh, at the end of what I say, you'll decide whether I do. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, I, and, and I know this is jumping to an I think we are in a highly interdenominational period. And, and that we have to say, our, our members, uh, Steve Cohn, I think, said that. Uh, when we, the last time I did a survey of the background of our members, probably 40% were not brought up in the reform movement. It's interesting. Uh, most who were not were from conservatives, some orthodox, some secular, some converts. But it is not, I don't believe that our members are making choices. We'll come to the issue of joining. Our members are making uh, their decisions on the basis of ideology. I think they're making it, as Steve Kahn would say, on the basis of aesthetics. Hmm. Right? They're going to where they're maybe where the friends are, where they like the rabbi has a reputation, where the religious school schedule is the right schedule. Um, it, it, if it's closer, can they walk to it? Can their kids walk to it? I think we're in a period. Now, I, I would say, let me put the orthodox aside because I think it may be somewhat different in that regard. But certainly between us, the, the, the free flow back and forth. And we've talked about it in terms of the you know, what's similar and what's different the, is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, and we do share members. And um, so I think we're in a time where one does not think about, I need to join a reform congregation or I need to join an orthodox congregation. Uh, I think our members are, are finding their way to a place that in some way will matter to them. And that means that, and to take, if they walk into a worship experience, and I'm here distinguishing between worship and prayer, it's something we may want to come back to. When they walk into a worship experience, it is one in which when they leave, they say, it made a difference for me. And that may be, depending on where they are in their own lives and, and what our congregations are doing. So, um, I believe that our, the choice of where our members are going are not going to be guided in, in denominational or move, movement terms. The, the problem with our national institutions, and here, the, quite honestly, the conservative rabbinate was way ahead, well, it wasn't way, about, about two years ahead of where I was uh, when I started the RVI. The, the, the issue of our our movements was that they were not doing what I think you said they should be doing. And the question is, are they now capable of doing it? Their, our, our movement, uh, our national organizations have shrunk. They've in some way minimalized. And I'm not, I would have hoped for other, but now that I look, I think about it, it may be the right thing because they we're not, they cannot be, and we're not the laboratories that you talked about. They were not the ones that were creating uh, the kinds of movements, and I would take it a step further, and they were not the ones taking care of the small congregations that we assume they were using the funds that we were giving. That's why 
I could legitimize our giving the amount of money, and still giving the amount of money we give. When I traveled around the country and we talked to the small congregations in our, in our movement and, and asked, what, what are, you, are you being served? And I didn't even mention the, you know, the names of particular organizations. Their response was always, no, they were not being served. So we had, I think, a, a desire to believe that our, na that our national institutions were the funnel through which we, the large congregations, could be supporting the small congregations to stay healthy. And I'm not sure, I know that wasn't happening in our movement. And so what we did was to start a program where we provided direct services to a group of congregations in the South, it happened to be. Congregations that may not survive, that in some way may be on their deathbed, but I always felt that if they were to die, they should at least die with dignity and have somebody by their side. So that's what we've done, and it's a program we would have liked the movement to have taken, and, and I mean our national institutions, and, and, and done something with. I believe now our national institutions can do little more than convene and facilitate. And as far as I'm concerned, that may be enough. In other words, and if we're experimenting with a full-time teacher program or with small groups or with you know, whatever initiatives we may begin, it will be up to us, and here's where I think movement does become important, to work with other of our like to do this beta testing so that we could perfect a, a model that then we, we can not ask the movement to do, but we, through the mechanisms of the movement, can, can tr make transportable, um, to make them reproducible. So I think that you know, the issue here is um, have our national institutions met the, the, the needs that we have as a community today or now have our national institutions, for whatever the reasons, and I think we can assess what they are, um, gone through a period of symptom, where it's kind of withdrawal, firstly because they're not getting funded. Right? And the reason they're not getting funded is for the reasons that you suggest, but I think it's not simply because we want to use the money ourselves. The question for our congregations was, where is the value added? And often the value added, which we believed was to help others, it would, and we, when you looked at it, it was not happening. So for a variety of reasons, uh, funding has reduced. The national institutions, rather than I believe being bold and courageous the way they could have been, uh, decided for whatever reasons not to, to handle it somewhat more safely, uh, have not done the level of structural finance, funding change that I think could have been helpful. And so now I think it, it, it is the congregations like ours. It is the, the congregations that have the ability to experiment, to be boldly, courageously innovative, to work with other congregations of like purpose to do the same, and then to make what we're doing transportable and reproducible. I think that our national institutions should convene the means by which that could happen and, and help facilitate the meetings with around, around the nation. And I think that's all it can be. Now, I don't know if this has answered the, the, the question you asked. Yes, it absolutely does. But I, I, but I, I also think this And I think we're on the same page. Yeah, I think, I think what um, we need to think about, putting the Pew, aside, Pew Report aside and whether we're different, is I think we are finding that, and, and this is where the Pew Report is somewhat, I think, um, incorrect, and even the, the studies that have been done within Jewish communities are a, a little bit incorrect, or not asking the questions fully. We know that the, this millennial community may not be joining, but they are creating, in their own ways, institutions not unlike the ones that Hours began, like, I mean, it's, it's so interesting to me. 
Ultimately, they'll start independent groups and then they'll institutionalize on some level. So the question is not whether they will join. What the, I think the issue is, do our institutions, even our institutions uh, that are represented here, will they, how do they continuously uh, shape themselves so that our members will say they make a difference in our lives? When I walk in there, whether for, for worship, is, does that worship make a difference in my life? Do, does my belonging to this institution make a difference? Can I, it's not only about the relationship with the rabbi, it's, it's also what is happening in that, in that, in terms of study, in terms of availability of, of processing oneself uh, to find a new meaning for themselves as they go through their lives. And I think it is a lot through study and it is a lot through ritual and it is a lot through tradition and which is part of the rediscovery of, of our members within the reform community. Thank you. So I want to interject if I can. Yeah, I was going to turn to you next, some, th something of the same question to talk I, about. I absolutely disagree with my colleagues uh, on, on, on where this thing is going. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to be irreverent or anything like that because you may be reflecting um, the way in which your respective congregations or movements, probably more the movements than the congregations, feel about these things. I've built my whole rabbinate on joining, on being part of the larger effort. Um, to some extent, perhaps a serious modern Orthodox congregation uh, has an advantage because the, the people are not walking into the synagogue uh, to be affected in some way by the worship that's going on there. They're walking into the synagogue because that's where you pray, that's where you come together, that's a Beit Knesset, it's a place of assembly, and, and you have to go. You don't really have a choice. So I, maybe we start out with an advantage, um, and I don't want to minimize that. Uh, you, you can't uh, spend Shabbat without being together with a whole community. That's where you hear the reading of the Torah. That's where you daven. Um, but it's more than that. The new uh, CEO elect and executive vice president elect of UJA Federation, Eric Goldstein, who is kind of a phenomenon and maybe to some extent reflective of some developments in, in uh, the Jewish community. He's a modern Orthodox uh, young man. Um, he's probably not as young as, uh, as some people might think, but to me he's a very young man. Uh, he has left a very successful litigation practice at Paul Weiss, uh, where he's a leading partner. And he has accepted upon himself the responsibility to succeed John Rusquet, which is an intimidating responsibility because John Rusquet has been fabulous as the CEO and executive vice president of UJA Federation, in my opinion. Led Federation into a much more Jewish place um, than it was and really built upon a lot of things that had been going on before. Uh, I don't want to get into the history too much. Now here is Eric Goldstein. Talk about, I, I, there's no question that bowling alone is a reality here in America. I would say having coffee at Starbucks alone is a reality too. Because if you look at Starbucks, uh, from the outside, I, I never go in because I haven't had my first cup of coffee yet in my life. <laughs> I don't. I don't like the taste of coffee. It makes two of us. In any, huh? You too. Yeah. We're both crazy, but uh, <laughs> whatever it is. So I pass by and I see people s sitting with their uh, 
cups of coffee, and they're on their laptops, or they're reading a book. They're, I, I thought Starbucks was supposed to be a place where people came together in like a coffee clutch. It's not. It's an absolute separatist uh, institution. And it's reflecting the bowling alone mentality. I don't know whether it's just my philosophy uh, or I think I see it in my community uh, that something that Eric Goldstein said, he spoke in our synagogue yesterday. It was his first talk in his new capacity in a synagogue. And he said something which I think everybody here should remember. If, if you walk away here talking about change and effect, and you can use it at your Seder on Pesach. You know we have four sons, and the Rasha, the wicked son, the second one. Why is he wicked? Because he says, what is this service to you? To you and not to him. And since since he took himself out from the community, it's not his worship service, it's somebody else's, it's yours. What is this all about? He took himself out from the community Kafar Be'ikar. He has denied the centrality or the central principle of Judaism. The central principle of Judaism is Klal Yisrael, the Jewish community. We are all part of something very, very important. And we can't afford to bowl alone. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that you think we should. On the contrary, you right, think but, we should. But, Rabbi, if you... But, but this is, the second child is uh, the millennial generation right now. So raise your hand if uh, you're going to be in shul on Shabbos at my shul. Or don't, okay, spoiler alert. This is what I'm going to speak about. Because right now... <laughs> By the way, I'm impressed that you already know what you're going to speak about. <laughs> I haven't even known. But what would we do he to the second his mind child? Yet, uh, <laughs> what would we do to the second child today? All right, we create something called birthright, where we'd incentivize and create a, a, a free price because these kids are not opting in. What would we do today to the second child? We'd create something called PJ Library, where we send, which you're a part of, which I'm a part of, where we send books out um, to families which are otherwise not associating. Um, you, so, so, so this gets into, frankly, something uh, that got you're the head of URJ in, in, in hot water about um, you know, the difference between the descriptive condition of American Jewry and being prescriptive about what they do. We don't wrap the teeth of the second child anymore. Or I don't, right? I, 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 I recognize that, there's this, that we're living in this moment of, 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 of non-affiliation or the, the, I agree with you 100 percent, 1,000 percent, that to, to, to not see yourself as part of the Jewish community is to miss out on a fundamental principle of what it means to be Jewish. But the question is, what are you going to do about it? So I, uh, I said I built my rabbit on it. Uh, we, we have a mission statement in Ramaz. Um, it's a very simple mission statement. We're interested in trying to do four things. One is to develop mention, a mensch. That's our first mission. Uh, our second mission is to develop young people who are committed to Torah, mitzvot, the Jewish people, and the state of Israel. Our third mission is academic uh, accomplishment within the ability of the particular student to reach for the highest that that student is able to do. But the fourth one is to have a sense of responsibility. That, as my grandson said when he worked uh, for 
uh, uh, in Hope, Pennsylvania for, um, oh God, it's a, it's a non-Jewish uh, um, effort where they went, 20 kids from Ramaz went on their President's Day weekend, uh, three-day weekend, uh, and they helped to reconstruct houses for poor people. Uh, habitat. Huh? Habitat. habitat for Humanity, right. I don't know why it was, uh, I was thinking of Project Renewal. Uh, habitat for Humanity. And I asked him when he came back, I said, what did you learn from this experience? He said, I learned that when there's a job to be done, we have to do it. And I said, you just stated the culmination of the mission statement of Ramaz, where he was a junior at the time. Um, Isaiah says, and I heard the voice of God saying, et mi eshlach, whom shall I send? Umi yelech lanu, who will go for me? And I answered, hinani shlacheni, here I am, send me. This is what I, this is what we try to develop in the congregation. So without tooting our horn, we were one of the most active synagogues in Soviet Jewry. Uh, in the whole struggle, when Natan Sharansky came to our synagogue and his first visit, I asked the kids, it was just the Ramaz kids who were there, there were about a thousand kids in the synagogue, uh, to hear him. I asked the kids, every child whose parents had gone to the Soviet Union to help refuseniks, to come and sit on the steps, and we didn't have enough room on the steps because there were about 120 families from the congregation and the school who had done exactly that. Husbands and wives who went to the Soviet Union to help refuseniks. Uh, uh, when, when on Yom Kippur we have a UJA appeal, I, I say to the people, why should somebody else be doing this work for us? We have to be doing the work. Why should somebody else be, feeling, be feeding a poor Russian Jew. I don't I have to go into all of the things that you've seen when you went to the Soviet Union uh, 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 together. No. It's my job. It isn't somebody else's job. And I always lead with my pledge. It's not my synagogue, so I'm not going to tell you what my pledge is. But it's a very significant pledge. And it's because I want to give an example that I am a joiner. I don't say that the theory is wrong about how American Jews and Americans in general are functioning, but that's the role of the synagogue, uh, at least as far as I see it. Yes, to develop more commitment to Torah and mitzvot, but in the, in the end, Torah and mitzvot is all about what you do for your community, and not just the Jewish community, the general community. Uh, so. You know, we know that if it's going to be a rally for some kind of a Jewish cause, our people have to get out there. And I tell my people, on Solidarity Sunday, we used to say, if you're not going to be at Solidarity Sunday marching down Fifth Avenue right, right outside of this uh, synagogue, marching for Soviet Jewry, if you're not going to do that, you better have a very, very good excuse because what are you here for if not for that? So I think that's... It, it isn't what the movement can do for me. It's what I can do for the movement. Can I, it's, can I ask a question, though, about that? Uh, you know, I think here we have four congregations that do belong right, to our movements. and. And, and, and I, I agree, we're in a bubble. I mean, here, it's not only that we're the Upper East Side. Uh, you know, I was thinking, Josh, I, I think you're just one day short of four months since you were installed. Is that correct? You have to do the math, right? Um, 
where, I mean, this is an amazing congregation. What you're, you're doing here is amazing. Haskell, you are extraordinary. You would have been extraordinary no matter where you were. And I, I actually remember um, being in front of your synagogue for Soviet Jewry, and I have photos of my kids up on my shoulders. And, and I remember going to the Soviet Union back in the early 80s, late 70s. Uh, but we're talking, on, I think the question is not about our synagogues, right? Because I think we have models here that are, are well-functioning and according to every measure. The issue is, does, with the up, this generation that's coming up, the you should, right, or you must resonate with them. In other words, you can say to your members, you, you know, to be, this is what you must, you should be in, you must be in services. That, that's how you connect to Jewish life. Are we at a time where the you shoulds and the you must uh, going to resonate, or do we have to, in fact, get out on the streets, which I think is, in fact, what happened with Birthright and is what's happening with, uh, you know, the JP Library and what's happening in, in, in many of the uh, initiatives that we're, we're thinking about. But is, is this a generation that innately, inertly, uh, inherently believes that there are the you shoulds and you must, at least Jewishly? Yeah. I, I don't want to monopolize this. I, I do, as you can tell, I feel very passionately about this. Uh, um, I can't speak for the conservative and reform movements. I don't know them well enough. I, I think one of the reasons that modern orthodoxy and not so modern orthodoxy, Haredi orthodoxy, are growing and doing more is because we're out there building institutions and building community. This Yachad program that I mentioned before for developmentally challenged uh, young people, that's a creation of the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America. Uh, National Council for Synagogue Youth, NCSY. You mentioned USY. NCSY is, is a joining uh, group. Uh, it, it, B'nai Akiva. I have children who live in Atlanta and they live in Cleveland. They're joiners. They're going all over the place. My grandchildren in Cleveland, they know the Midwest much better than I know because they've gone to all these uh, conclaves of B'nai Akiva or NCSY, uh, I think we are joining. Um, we're building day schools. I mean, who wants to spend so much time and effort and commitment and funds to create day schools? But that is what we are doing, and we're basically doing it because we feel an obligation far beyond ourselves. Um, I don't know that it was always this way, but I, I certainly see it now. I, I see people giving their lives to this general cause. To me, Eric Goldstein is emblematic. He's extraordinary. He's not run of the mill at all, but he's emblematic of what a guy could do. And I know of another layperson, also an outstanding lawyer, who's on the verge of becoming the CEO, professionally, of another organization. Uh, I can't talk about it because he hasn't made the decision completely yet. It's none of our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, he, he actually he wants to be he wants to be reasonably sure that the lay leadership of that organization will give him a chance to do what he feels needs to be done. And he's he's already at the age of retirement from his law practice, and this is his new job: retire, moving on to something else. And I hope he does it. And that's an exact example of, of what I'm talking about feeling 
when you hear the voice, whom shall I send and who will go for me, answering, here I am, send me. It's counterintuitive in the American culture. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I don't, I'm not ashamed to get up in my synagogue and say, you must and you should and you have to do it, uh, whether it's collecting ma'ot chitim, Passover relief at this season of the year where we have for the first time in my life, we have several families in our synagogue on the Upper East Side of Manhattan where we are literally keeping them afloat because they've come into tough times. And I tell my people, we're collecting money not just for Met Council and for all kinds of causes. We're also collecting it for people who are sitting next to you in synagogue and you don't know how they are suffering. So everybody has to do it um, and not remove ourselves from Agreed. the community. Agreed. I want to ask one more question for each of you. The time is, is, is passing, but I want to give each of you the opportunity to um, to come back to sort of the overarching theme uh, that we set for this panel. Um, Dr. Amy Sales of Brandeis wrote a number of years ago that the term denomination might not be the best one to use in describing our various streams. She liked, and I like very much, the term movement much better because movement suggests a galvanizing cause. With all of the challenges facing American Jewry today, from alienation from Jewish communal institutions of which we've spoken, to alienation from Israel, what contributions do you think your respective movements can make towards securing the future of Jewish life in America? Would it be more helpful if we wound up in a situation where we had traditional and liberal? Or is it important that we maintain our movement identity? And within the Orthodox world, Rabbi Luxtein, is it important that those who are more inward directed follow your lead and be more comfortable sitting around the communal table with others from the Jewish community and empower women in roles of leadership as as many uh, in the modern, modern Orthodox world have begun to do. So that's a question I would ask for the three of you about our movements, the role that each one plays in securing the future of this American Jewish project, and is movement identity ultimately important? So could, who would want to be? You can want I to jump in for? OK, so you'll I, go first, then I'll, Peter, okay, then, and I'll then try to I'll try to stick to below my five minutes. You know, the trouble is, when you run a program like this, you have to have a clock. That makes what? no, no. The what? It doesn't make any noise. There's got to be a noise that that stops people like me. You from... want to know something? On the lecterns on these pulpits, there are in fact clocks. It's yeah. a message to the rabbi about when to. And you know what the first thing I do when I get up there is? I cover it. Well, I want to tell you, you're 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 in a wonderful tradition, because in our synagogue on the front place, the front barrier of the women's balcony, we, we have something like this, and facing the pulpit, there was a clock when I grew up as a child. The synagogue was renovated in 1946-47, right after World War II, and that clock mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> that was my father's doing, and he was a yekka. <laughs> You know, he, he would have been very much at home here. He got into the pulpit at 11 o'clock. There was a, a nunnery next door to us. Now there's a big high rise. The nunnery was there and it had a gong. And the gong would go, 11 gongs, and he would start his sermon. And at 11.30, there was a single gong on the half hour. And he was always saying, Amen. <laughs> Those were the days when half hour sermons were acceptable. Today, they would throw me out of the synagogue in a minute if I try to give a half-hour sermon. Look, talk about denominationalism and movements and so on. 
I happen to be a practical pluralist in my um, approach to the Jewish people. I know that not all Jews are going to do things the same way. There was a time when we all lived in shtetlach and ghettos and so on, but since the emancipation, that's not happening anymore. So we're going to reach for God and community and Judaism in different ways. And I absolutely respect that. And I mean, I've loved my interplay with conservative and reform rabbis and learned a lot from them. I actually, I've learned this morning several things from an old colleague, though younger than I, <laughs> and a baby, uh, <laughs> Elliot Cosgrove. Uh, so these things, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Josh Davidson too, but you're the no, baby. I, I'm the youngest of all. I, uh, I loved his reference to your black hair. <laughs> A, I had hair once and it was black. But I'm not a theoretical pluralist. I'm a practical pluralist, but I don't necessarily believe that everything is the same correctness in terms of one's practice of Judaism. In theory, I think my movement's way is the correct way. A commitment to halacha, to Torah, mitzvot, obligations, you know, rather than rights and so on and so forth. I don't believe that Haredi Judaism, uh, ultra-Orthodoxy, is the right way. I don't think we should be ghettoized. I think we should be betoch ha'ir, in the community and very much involved. But I think there is a right way to do it. I respect the fact that others think there's a different right way to do it. And I want to be together with, with everybody. So that's the, f I don't know whether that comes out denominations or movements. It, I've never really thought very much about that. Uh, I, you know, in Hebrew, the adjective follows the noun. In English, the adjective precedes the noun. So I speak about Orthodox Judaism. In Hebrew, it would be Yahadut Orthodoxit. First, you're a Jew, and then you happen to be Orthodox. That's the way I think we should be looking at ourselves. First, we're Jews, and we have different ways of expressing our Judaism. I want to say a word about our challenges. My movement's challenges. Excuse me to the microphone. Uh, one challenge that I have uh, is how I deal with people who are significantly to the right of me. How I keep my community centrist, modern orthodoxy, and not tipping to the right. And so far, Thank God we've been very successful. I don't feel any pressure to pull to the right. I don't want to get into the details on it. Um, I think the right has contributed a lot to the Jewish world. Uh, another major challenge is how we deal with the issue of women's role uh, in, not so much in the service, in, but in general women's role. I remember in 1970, I went to my mentor, my teacher, Rabbi Soloveitchik, a blessed memory. Uh, women were not members of our congregation in 1970. If they were married, they were members by virtue of their husbands. If they were not married, they had a, it was called special member. They actually didn't have a right to vote. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, this is crazy. I mean, you can't do this. So I went to the Rav, and the Rav said, absolutely, women should be members of the congregation, and they should be trustees of the congregation. They have the same corporate rights and responsibilities as men have. Why did I go to Rav Soloveitchik? Because I knew that I, we had on the board of the synagogue any number of men who... Well, they were perfectly nice men, but when it came to something like this, so radical, they would go berserk. 
So I went to the authority and came back with his psaq. And of course we made the change and today we have women officers, we have a woman vice president and so on. We, we could have a woman president. I'd be very happy to have a woman president. How you integrate women somehow in the synagogue service, that's not so simple. Yesterday, we did something we had never done before in the main service of a synagogue. To you, it's going to sound like, this is a big deal. But for us, it was a little bit of a big deal. The cantor, as he was bringing the Torah back, we're on one floor now because we're not in our main synagogue. So we're in an auditorium. So on the suggestion, actually, of that vice president of the synagogue, I decided to go for broke. And he handed over the Torah to this woman, uh, and she carried the Torah through the women's section. And sort of the women kind of, they didn't know what to do. <laughs> Should they kiss the Torah? Should they not kiss the Torah? So, so after we had done it, um, uh, I got up and I, I said, because we had, a, we had a bat mitzvah celebration this weekend. It was actually last night. And sitting in the congregation was an aunt of the bat mitzvah who was, she's the immediate past president of JOFA. That's Jewish Orthodox Feminists Association. So she's very active in this thing. So I said, I want you all to know that the reason we pass the Torah through the women's section is not because Carol Newman uh, is sitting here as the past president of Jofa. It's something that we decided to do. And any number of women were very, very moved by it. And a couple of the men made some kind of snide comments later. Okay, as I said, you'll think this is silly. I mean, what's the big deal? But you move slowly. This is one of the areas of, of a challenge. But the real challenge that the modern Orthodox community faces is not just a challenge of ours, it's a challenge of American Jewry. And I'm not talking about the challenge of assimilation. I'm talking about the challenge of day school affordability. Because we have all been incredibly enriched by day schools. Uh, and certainly the modern Orthodox community has grown immeasurably because of day schools. But now it's costing $30,000, $35,000 higher even to send one child to day school. Imagine if, God forbid, you happen to have three or four children, which is frankly what we should all be doing because demographically that's the only way we're going to have continuity. So you have to spend between one hundred and twenty and one hundred and forty thousand dollars on day school education. Pre-tax. Pre-tax. Yeah, you, a person making a half a million dollars who has to spend, let's say, one hundred and forty thousand dollars on day school education practically needs a scholarship. And nobody who's making a half a million dollars wants to fill out a very, very tough scholarship form, which is what you need because you don't want people taking advantage of you. So this, there's a huge, huge responsibility to provide funds until the federal government begins to do it, which is a while away, so that day school education can uh, thrive and continue to thrive because that is the biggest future for my movement I think it's the biggest future for the conservative movement too uh, and it's not easy because among non-orthodox Jews day school education is an option it's not an absolute necessity for most orthodox Jews it's a necessity uh, so first of all, we have to make the option more affordable for those who are not orthodox. Reform started out having day schools, and I think 
by and large, they've disappeared for the most part. And it's, it's harder and harder. So that, that's the biggest challenge, frankly, that uh, my movement faces. So I, I took my five minutes. And, uh, <laughs> Let me turn the question. Who wants to go next? Uh -huh. All right. So, so, so I will only say I uh, actually never trust a rabbi who says I will only say. Uh, uh, I, I agree with, uh, with Haskell, with Rabbi Lookstein, that uh, I, I am a, uh, pra what was your term? A practical Plural. pluralist, pluralist. Uh, but not necessarily a theoretical pluralist. Uh, I, I believe in the ideology of the conservative movement. Uh, I don't, don't do so out of some sort of atavistic loyalty to it or because that's what my degree says. I believe that it's uh, a struggle with liberalism and traditionalism uh, is not only reflective of my own personal struggles and aspirations, but has a uh, unique, exciting voice in the American and world Jewish landscape. Uh, the way it struggles uh, with, you know, you know, it's interesting, you talk about small revolutions in, in your synagogue. Uh, you know what happened in my synagogue this Shabbos? And I, don't, and I haven't heard anything about it. Uh, we put hooks on the door uh, of the ladies' room for talesim. Okay? Now, no, no one necessarily knew. There wasn't sort of a board decision. Uh, but it, it, it's fascinating because in my community, there are women rabbis, women cantors, we all read Torah equally, we're all full members of, of, of in worship, on the board, everything. There's no distinction. But no one ever got around to putting hooks on the ladies' room uh, so they put a talus. And, and, and the fact of the matter is that uh, the, the congregation, you, uh, we have, a, everyone knows that we're a, a staunchly egalitarian synagogue, uh, but you could probably count maybe five or six women who wear a talus on a Shabbos. And so I think that's a, a great example of what, what I'm shorthanding this blend of traditionalism and liberalism means, uh, that, uh, that everyone stands equal before God, but I, I think that there's also uh, a, a, a small c conservatism built into the fabric of the community, uh, and I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. Uh, and 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 the messaging is not just when you have three, you know, uh, four rabbis up uh, in a beautiful place like this, but whether you're putting hooks on the bathroom door. Uh, and and these are these are these are very clear messages. Uh, I, I do think, uh, Rabbi, that uh, I think we are in a time of uh, tightening belts and uh, I think and diminishing Jewish resources and the question of how movements can retain their distinctive voices but find points of common cause, I think is a very important conversation. Uh, you know, pastoral education is pastoral education is pastoral education, whether it's at HUC, YU, or JTS. Uh, questions on, uh, on the, the, there are, you know, when, when I went to the University of Chicago, I saw how the Protestants do it, that they take their three years of core courses and whatever it might be, and then they get their denominational label with sort of a finishing school afterwards. Um, because there are certain things that Bible is Bible, whether you're a Methodist or a Lutheran or a wh whatever the denomination is. And, and I think, you know, I, I think Jewish institutions don't like to put themselves out of business. Uh, but I don't, I don't see why there can't be areas uh, either intra-congregationally or amongst the seminaries, or amongst the movements even, that we all say we all face a crisis in day school education. It's not an orthodox issue, it's not a conservative issue, it's not a reform issue. Uh, let's figure it out. 
and, I, and we could probably list about 10 of those issues uh, in the next 10 seconds. Thank you. Peter, last word for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of that, uh, and I have that same yekkerish uh, tendency to end on time, so I'll speak, time. I'll speak quickly. Take no, I, you know, it's the David Saperstein School. You don't cut what you have to say, you just pick up the tempo. Um, uh, firstly, Josh, I, I, I um, thank you for having brought us together. You know, in our crazy world, as much as, uh, as one or the other of us may have uh, time uh, during the year, it's rare to have this, had this kind of conversation uh, with colleagues that you both adore, respect, and with whom you have so much in common. So. Once again, you, uh, you lead the way. We talk about in another tradition that a child shall lead. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really quite wonderful. I, 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 uh, in conclusion, I, I need to suggest that what we've heard today is really through a very unique and, and rather limited lens. Because the fact is we are in New York. And we are on the east side of New York. And um, uh, we have not talked about what's happening around this country or, in fact, around this world. Because for me, the, the issue of um, that we're, the big issues we're addressing are significant issues that was once the former Soviet Union. Now we know what's happening in Europe and, and to Jews there and uh, in, in South America and most, most significantly for me in Israel. And, and I think that what we haven't spoken about, but is on our minds, I know it's on our minds, is the engagement, and here it's even in the Orthodox community because we've read about it, the engagement of our kids with Israel um, and, and how they are asking the questions to do that. So I'm going to use that actually as a kind of a template for, or f to continue. The, the thing is that the lines between that I don't think uh, movements are going to go away. I don't think that our national institution is going to go away because of the nature of that's what you know, the agenda is to survive. That's not to say they shouldn't go away. <coughs> but in reality, historical anchors and identity anchors are very binding. So for Central Synagogue or Park Avenue or KJ or, or, or Temple Emmanuel, the Congregation Emmanuel, to think of itself as anything other than how we began is is just uh, incomprehensible. It's never going to happen. So just for history, it, history grounds us, whether it's a history of Jew or history is a Reformed Jew, it grounds us. And our identity is with those other congregations that are of like movement. Uh, we have relationships with those, we have history with those, and we will continue in some way to work differently with those. So I don't think uh, that, that's why I don't say we're in a post-denominational era. I do think we're, and I, the word I prefer is interdenominational, and it's a certain way what we've talked about. You know, whether one talks about it is, uh, uh, however we talk, we, we talk, we, we each said that in some way our relationship with each other and with our, the way we extend our <laughs> embrace is to include everybody. Uh, and I, and I, in fact, I do mean everybody. However, within our movements, there are certain shifts that were not going to be predicted even 10 years ago. Some of them are political, by the way. You know, it's, it's not only uh, economic shifts and demographic shifts, but political shifts. It once was within the reform community, you could pretty well say we're liberal Democrats. Well, that, that shifted. And therefore, even the Religious Action Center and, and what it represents in terms of shaping the future of American Jewry here by shaping America here, is, is going to be different uh, going ahead. And I know that we're in a certain way in the, um, the tension point in, in some of those shifts. And we need to recognize that this is a time of incredible, uh, both incredible challenge and incredible uh, writhing. I would call it writhing under some of the forces that are, that are working on us. Um, I believe that uh, the, these lines of uh, these more increasingly porous lines are going to, I think, both be uh, difficult for some congregations because people are going to find themselves shifting and they may move for, for purposes of um, aesthetics, shift congregations or join more than one congregation. 
I, I, however, having talked about Israel, will say that the template for us is that there are matters, and I would say they're not only institutional matters, how, why our religious schools all have to be separate, why our adult learning always has to be separate. In a community like, like the, certainly this east side Manhattan community, when you think about the, um, the, duplicit, the, the duplication, not the, the duplication, the, the amount of money, the amount of energy that we are expending um, so that each one of us has a standalone program in everything, it's, when you think about it on a level of business model or even ideologically, it's ridiculous. There is so much we could be doing together, which would save the current, current, every congregation's um, uh, finances. So I think the future has that, and I do perceive it as you can do courses 101 and 201 together, and 301, you know, much more specific and attuned. Um, I would even go as far, and this is a topic for another conver conversation, and to talk about conversion in that regard. Um, you know, certainly there are certain basic things we could be doing together. Uh, I don't know how far it could go. But um, you know, we're facing a time when what's shifting in, in, our, in our community, the Jewish community, is also shifting in the general religious community. And there's a flow of people who are investigating how can Judaism be important in their lives, both Jews doing that and non-Jews doing that. Because they, there are many non-Jews who are looking for something different from what they have. And we should be able to uh, welcome them in, um, in, in some ways. So I would say that the, the future is going to be, we're not going to do away with movements. We're all going to have some kind of, uh, we will support, have identity with, and uh, connection to our historical and our present roots. I think my sense is our national institutions, maybe not in the Orthodox, but in the Reform Movement, maybe in the Conservative, are going to need to redefine ourselves. I think the definition of our movements are going to be the congregations and not the national institutions. Um, the national institutions probably will decreasingly speak for the movement as a whole. Uh, and that's been an issue within our movement. I don't know whether it's been an issue within yours. Who speaks for us? Well, nobody has elected any one individual to speak for all of us. And that's a, that's a question. So I think the, the congregations are going to, I think the great congregations like ours are going to carry the movements forward. That well, our responsibility is to be the laboratory, to create the programs, to work with other congregations to do it, to call upon our, our national organizations to bring those congregations together and support those congregations in doing uh, and making these programs uh, national programs. And ultimately, um, I believe that it is going, if we do this right, and I believe we will. Uh, communities like ours will be redefined in the minds of our, in the minds of our, our Jews, our Jews, that uh, they will think of the, re, the Jewish world as something other than only their, their particular synagogue. And if that happens for me, we will have done much better. Will you please join me in thanking Rabbi Haskell Lookstein, Rabbi Peter Rubenstein, and Rabbi Elliot Castro. <laughs> Rabbi Lookstein used a phrase earlier in his remarks, betoch ha'ir, it's a, a phrase that comes from Genesis. Abraham is arguing with God about the fate of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and he says, if there be 50, 50 40, but tochair within the city who are innocent, would you wipe away the innocent along with the guilty? And ultimately, of course, there aren't enough to save the cities. But when the rabbis talk about that phrase, but tochair, they say it's not that there weren't enough righteous within the city. It's that there weren't enough people who were concerned with wrestling about what was going on betochair. Weren't concerned enough with the future of that city in order for it to survive. 
we're in the presence of three rabbis who have never stopped wrestling with what is going on within their communities and within the wider American Jewish and world Jewish communities. And it is thanks to their leadership that our future is as bright, I would believe, as it is. I'm so grateful to the three of you. And before all of you go, I want to offer you a couple of invitations to come back. Because on Wednesday night at 6.30, Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, the Chancellor of the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, our Reform Seminary, is going to explore the great currents of 20th century Judaism and how they have influenced and transformed our reform movement and what the future might hold for Reform Judaism. <coughs> on May 1st at 7 o'clock, Rabbi Dr. Lawrence Hoffman is going to deliver our annual Charles Grossman Lecture in Jewish Intellectual History titled How We Pray is Who We Are.